Hello, microbiologists. Let's talk about Berge's manual and how to use Berge's manual to identify your bacteria that you isolated from your skin microbiota. So Berge's manual is uh, a, a very old reference book uh, dating back to the 1920s when Ber David Berge was the first editor to develop a, a book of all the information that was becoming available uh, about different types of bacteria. Because remember in those days, the major focus of, of bacteriology was to isolate bacteria, grow them in pure culture, learn everything we could about them. That went on pretty much right up until the age of antibiotics when people stopped caring about uh, bacteria until of course we realized they do have superpowers and we should have kept going all along. But uh, this book was the first edition uh, called Determinative Bacteriology, which was literally about identifying uh, the different characteristics and features of bacteria and then actually giving them names. So this is, I, I don't wanna call it old school because it is certainly something that we still do. Uh, but the, the approach is complementary to the genomic methods that we're using uh, which are far more expansive. So being able to sequence the genomes of all organisms in one place and identifying them that way um, is different than using our culture-based methods because I think, you know, at this stage, I hope you realize that something like 99% of all the bacteria out there, we will never be able to grow them in culture. I shouldn't say that. Someday maybe we'll be able to if we care to, um, but now we can identify them by their genes. So it's a complementary process to that. And if you don't have access to very expensive DNA sequencing equipment, which we do not, it is a way to identify bacteria. And it is one that's still used in clinical laboratories. It's still used in research laboratories. So it's a very good method. So this is Berge's manual, uh, what it looks like. We have copies of this book in the lab. There are copies in the library as well. Um, it is the ninth edition of this book. Uh, there is no 10th edition of this book. Unfortunately, it's not online, so we will have to actually use the reference book itself in the lab or in the library. Um, much of it I have been able to reproduce for you and put into the folder in Blackboard that I'm going to label HSMP for Human Skin Microbiome Project. It will be its own standalone folder, so you will be able to access some of the written information in this book, but not all of it. So you will need to be present in lab to complete the final stage of the process, which will be to identify the genus. So if you look at Berge's manual, the point was not so much to uh, classify the bacteria, that's the purpose of another uh, book and actually a whole other line of science, so it's not about phylogeny, and it's not even really about taxonomy, which is naming and classifying. It's really about saying, here's a bunch of shared characteristics all these organisms have, all these microbes have, so they're gonna be in a group together. Um, starting with you know, really big picture commonalities and then moving down into the, the, fine, you know, the fine tuning of those identities. So it is, as I mentioned, it is one way, and I'm calling it the Berge's way, um, to identify bacteria, and it is the way you're going to use uh, to identify the genus of your uh, skin bacteria. So how, what are the observable traits? What are we going to be looking at to identify the bacteria? And these are, uh, uh, that's, this is a listing of the different kinds of things that we can use uh, to identify bacteria based on observable traits, or traits meaning characteristics, just features that we can see we feel, we can taste, we don't ever taste, uh, smell, that kind of thing. So notice the list, uh, morphology, right? So the shape of the cells, the size of the shells, uh, the cells, how are they arranged? Um, are there features like endospores or metachromatic granules or capsules? What kind of cell wall do they have, which we can do staining methods to figure out? Are they gram positive, gram negative? Are they acid fast cell walls? Uh, how do they grow? Do they, what do the colonies look like when you grow them on solid media? Do they grow in liquid media? And where in the media do they grow? Do they produce pigments? These are all uh, very easily observable characteristics as long as a bacteria can be grown in culture. And then, you know, their lifestyle, that's nutrition and physiology here, and actually to some degree also biochemistry. You know, what 
kinds of food do they like to eat? So what do we do? We feed them things and see if they metabolize it. And if they metabolize it, do they produce end products that we can measure? So we can determine all of these things using laboratory-based tests, which you will start doing next week in lab. And uh, for the next two weeks, we'll be, you'll, you will be learning all of the different kinds of uh, approaches, laboratory culture-based testing that we can do to help us identify our bacterial species. So from this list, um, you'll be able to, you'll, you will be looking at all these different features and compiling a fingerprint, if you will, a phenotypic fingerprint of your bacteria so you can compare it to the ones that are in Berge's manual. And that's how you will identify your bacteria. But Berge's manual is a thousand page reference book. It is full of lots of great information. But if you don't understand the process, the book itself can be a little overwhelming. And that's why I wanted to do this today with you. So first and foremost, um, I have provided in uh, the folder in Blackboard, uh, the, the first early chapters, the introductory chapters uh, for you to have access to. So uh, the table of contents, why is that important? Mostly because it lists all of the different genuses that are, are in this book broken up according to their groups. So that's why that is helpful. It's just a helpful, quick, uh, at a glance kind of way to look at all the different genuses that there might be. Chapter one is titled Using This Manual. So it's gonna tell you how to use the manual. So read it, it's two pages long. It will help you um, understand the process. Number two is, is for the same idea, right? So the nature of identification schemes. So what are we trying to do here? So we're not trying to determine the phylogeny, who's related to who, what's the family tree. We're trying to say you here right now, this is who you are. And therefore, because we know a lot about this, we can go find out more about you. Chapter three, um, I didn't even, I'm not gonna even include that. It's, you know, you already know, the have been there, done that, about what are the differences between a prokaryote and eukaryote. So if you find a microscopic organism, Berge threw it in there because it turns out it could be a prokaryote or it could be a eukaryote. How do you tell the difference? Um, so at this stage of the game, we, I think you got that. So you don't really need to read it unless you would like to. And then chapter four and five are the two that are kind of key. Chapter four discusses the, the four major groupings of bacteria, which are determined according to the cell wall of the bacteria. So um, the four major categories, I'll show you that in a second. And then number five is the, is, a, is the groups within each of those four major categories. So the next step would be to identify the genus, which um, you know, that's, that's what the whole rest of the book is devoted to. So read about the four major categories. Um, helpful hint, it's about the cell wall. And then go look at chapter five is what is going to, you're gonna use that to narrow down um, your choices of the possible different genuses that your bacteria might belong to. Okay, so here's my version, here's my overview of the process uh, according to Berge's. This is the Berge's way. So in the Berge's way, um, you know, all bacteria in the whole wide world of, of which we know about by these culture-based methods, just so realize this is a limited number of them uh, to begin with. But nonetheless, um, they're, uh, they're grouped into these major categories. And this is based on their cell wall type. And so here are the four major groups. We have negative bacteria group, or major category number one. Major category number two are the gram-positive bacteria. So in other words, they have those gram-positive cell walls. Number three are the bacteria that don't have a cell wall. So these are the bacteria that are called the molecutes, which uh, you read about in your previous reading. These are bacteria that do not have a cell wall, which makes them very bendy and flexible. Uh, it also was sort of uh, one of those findings that took people aback because of course all bacteria were supposed to have cell walls. Um, and now we're realizing there's quite a few of these bacteria, different types, but they don't have cell walls, right? So we're not gonna be able to use our classic staining techniques to identify those. And then there are the archaea. Uh, Berge's called them the archaeobacteria because at the time that the last edition of Berge's occurred, we were still calling them that. Since that time, um, you know, they've been solidified into that one huge domain 
if you will, of bacteria known as the archaea, which again, you have, we have talked about as far as what are the characteristics that distinguish the archaea from uh, prokaryotes. So these are the non-bacteria uh, types of bacteria. So, and I also notice I made this purple because if you recall, I limited the project to only choosing a gram positive bacteria uh, for the purposes of biosafety. So you already, you know what the major category of your bacteria is, it's gonna be this gram positive bacteria, but we're gonna go through the process from start to finish anyway. Within eight, each major category, there are several groups. Um, and these are mostly based on cellular characteristics. So looking under the microscope, again, after we decide what the cell wall is made of, then we go look at things like, what's the shape and the arrangement of those cells? Are there any intracytoplasmic bodies like endospores, metachromatic granules, or anything else, any other features? Anything we can note about their colonies? That's what the groups are, are based on. And then once you've identified the group, each group consists of you know, a couple dozen or more different genuses. And this is the point that we are going to. We are going to identify the genus of your skin bacteria. And what you need to know is the habitat and the lifestyle of the bacteria. By lifestyle, I'm talking about those biochemical, physiological, metabolic properties that we'll be starting on um, to investigate next week, right? Starting with where do, where do they live? So Burgi's characterized, one of the major characteristics is where did it come from in the first place? Did it come from soil? Did it come from underground? Did it come from uh, a, a human source or a, a mammalian source? So those are all those characteristics that we can look at that can help us narrow down to, to certain genuses of bacteria. Um, the lifestyle, this aerobic versus anaerobic lifestyle is another one uh, that we will be determining using laboratory-based tests. So we're gonna end here, but obviously each genus uh, contains one or more species. Some genuses only consist of a single species, but many have several different species, um, which we can determine based on the results of specific laboratory tests. So we are not going to identify species. However, if you are deeply intrigued, it is possible for you to identify the species of your bacteria of the genus that you were able to isolate from your skin. Um, and if you're super duper interested, you can, you know, be a, put together the test, figure out what tests you need to perform and perform them and try to determine that too. That is not part of this project, but it could be part of uh, an initial project that if you wanted to, to take that role on. Okay, so here's our process from gigantic to big to narrow to single. We end at narrow uh, because at, in, at this stage of the game in microbiology that we are mostly looking at um, you know, genus level types of characteristics, even when we are looking at their genomes. Um, so nonetheless, that's what we are, where we are at. So I thought the easiest way to try to explain how to use Bergie's manual would be to go through the process. So we started the project by uh, grabbing bacteria from your skin, you grew them on a plate um, as a mixed culture, and then you isolated three into pure cultures. And here's mine. So here are my three pure cultures, um, which you can see they're very distinct, uh, different types of bacteria, different colonial appearances, different characteristics like pigments, and also um, you know, their overall texture and that sort of thing. And I isolated them from my antecubital fossa. So everybody in anatomy physiology, think real hard, where's that? And I'm gonna tell you it was the inside of my arm, right? So right on the inside of my elbow. And uh, so I, I grew them and I looked at them all by gram staining them. And based on my gram stain results, and because I liked the way the colonies looked because I do like that bright pigmented yellow, I chose this one to be my project bacteria. This is my one, the one. Okay, so that's what I know about it so far. So I'm gonna go through the process from start to finish. So the first thing I would wanna do is say, all right, what is the major category? So to figure that out, I need to do a gram stain. So I did that, I made a smear, I stained it using the gram stain method, and here is my gram stain outcome. 
So these are the four major categories. What do I need to know from this gram stain in order to figure out what the major category is? And the answer is, what's the color that the bacteria are, the cells look? And they're purple, which means that these are gram-positive bacteria. So because I'm looking at these cells and they are purple and gram-positive, what I can do is say, hmm, I can rule out the gram-negative bacteria. Why? Because mine were not gram-negative. I can rule out the bacteria without cell walls. Why? Because I would not be able to stain them using the gram stain method if they were without cell walls. And I can rule out the archaea because they have a completely different type of cell wall that this doesn't work on. And again, I wouldn't be able to stain them if I were using the gram stain. So by I had just you know, out of all bacteria in the whole wide world, I just ruled out 75% of them because they don't match with the gram stain result for my bacteria. So my major category is major category number two. Helpful hint, it, yours is gonna be major category number two because I asked you to please only choose a bacteria that was gram positive. Okay, so where do I go from here? The next step is to now that I know what the major category is and I've eliminated all those in the other categories, I'm gonna focus in on major category number two. So how do I know what groups are in major category number two? And the answer is I go to Berge's. Actually, you don't have to go to Berge's because this is one of the tables. This is from chapter five and chapter five I have up is in Blackboard for you to look at. So looking at chapter five, um, this notice Roman numeral five, uh, in case you were wondering why it's a V, there are 35 separate groups of bacteria organized into these four major categories. So that's what chapter five is. It is a listing of all of the different groups within all four of the major categories. So my major category was major category number two. So I'm going to go to that page, which shows me major category number two. All of the groups, groups starting with 17, so major category one was groups one through 16, 17 through 29 are in this, are part of major category number two. These are all the gram positive cell wall type of bacteria listed here. Um, notice 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and then 22 through 20 is pretty broad and they're all kind of lumped into one, okay? So there they are. What's important about this? So here's, this is just the title of the group, the name of the group, which is kind of self apparent as to what the major feature we're looking at here is. Here is a little blurb that gives you more important details about what those bacteria are, what they look like, what you should be looking for. Here is the group number, group name. And then I just wanna point out that under each group number is a page number. And those page numbers tell you, once you have decided on a group, what page do I go to, which tells me all about the genuses that are in that group. And that's where notice it starts at page 500 something. So that's why it's important to refer to this table first, instead of just plowing through pages and pages and pages, it will tell you exactly where to go. But first, you have to decide which of these groups your bacteria belongs in. Okay, so here, here's just a shortcut version. I listed out the groups uh, because I found it, find it easier to just, just look at them this way. Here are the uh, 12 groups within major category two. Um, notice they are described according to their shape, right? So we've got cocci rods, We've got endospore forming. We have the regular versus irregular non-spore forming rods. Differences, irregular rods are the ones with metachromatic granules or the ones that do the dip the right thing or the ones that have weird sh irregular shapes. They're not regular repeating rods. All they all look the same. The cells kind of look a little differently. I have the mycobacteria, which are the acid fast cell wall types of bacteria that I'm not gonna be able to stain super easily. And then the actinoacetes, which, uh, you know, just mentioning that these are uh, those filamentous bacteria that were thought to be fungi uh, for a long time. 
And, you know, fun fact, one of the first antibiotics that were identified coming from soil organisms came from an actinomycete called streptomycin. Um, streptomycin is the antibiotic. Streptomycete is the name of the bacteria. But when they first found it, they thought they were fungi. And part of that was because the very first antibiotic, penicillin, came from a mold. And these guys, so under the microscope, kind of look a little bit like molds until you look closer and realize that their cells don't have any nucleus, of course. So that's what these guys are, are, are. So I'm looking at this and I say, all right, and I read the little blurbs about all of it and all the features. And I'm saying, what do I need to know to figure out what group my bacteria are in? So I'm gonna go back to my gram stain, right? So here it is, they're gram positive. The shape of the cells are cocci. And you'll also notice another feature I can tell you right now about these bacteria is that they are cocci in tetrads, right? So I'm looking at these nice organized little boxes. Even in these clusters, the bacteria are organized in nice little boxes. So these are gram-positive cocci in tetrads. So I don't need to know that right now. What I, I'm looking at this, it's like, oh, well, look, they're gram-positive cocci. Group 17 are gram-positive cocci. So I'll quick read the blurb and see that it says, yep, they're gram-positive cocci, okay? So I'm gonna leave that one in my pile. Group 18, um, gram-positive rods and cocci. So I'm gonna leave that in for right now. Looking at this one, gram-positive rods, nope. Looking at this one, gram-positive rods, nope. Mycobacteria, again, I'm not going to be able to stay in period, nope. And the actinomyces, these are not filamentous in any way at all, so I'm going to rule those out, leaving me with these two. So the question is, how do I decide if it's group 17 or 18? And the answer is, group 18 form endospores. I see no endospores. So therefore, I'm also going to rule out group 18, leaving me with the group of my bacteria, which are the gram-positive cocci. Now, many of you I know will have bacilli, which means you'll be able to rule out 17, and you'll have to read the blurbs to figure out how to decide among group 18, 19, and 20, which group your bacteria belong in. So, but mine, getting back to mine, are group 17 gram-positive cocci. So I'm very happy about that. Um, now the next step is to identify the genus. So where do I go from there? And here I am with my very thoughtful emoji because hmm, here's what I know so far. My bacteria in group 17, table 5.2 said go to page 527. So the next step for me is to go to page 527. So that's what I do. And this is page 527. And in this chapter, right, about the gram-positive cocci is a brief paragraph that tells you about the group in general, and then it lists all of the different genuses that are found in that group, right? So here's that page, and then I'm going to turn the page. Whoops. I guess I can't play my video. I have a video. Let's try. Oh, it will let me. Okay. So notice, I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. All these genuses, if it were me, I'd be listing them because that's how I work. I'm going to list out those genuses. And then I see, oh gosh, so in this group, there's 20 or so different genuses. Mine is going to be one of them. So now, how do I know which one it is? So just kind of looking, going back here, each of these little blurbs gives you all of the important details and features in a very general, general way about the bacteria that are in that, those genus, in those, that particular genus. So you need to read them. I call them the obituaries because it's one paragraph of here's the most important things uh, uh, that, these, that, that this genus of bacteria has accomplished in its lifetime. So you're going to read through the little obituary, and then you're going to say, okay, here's my list, and I'm going to say which ones match with mine and which ones can I rule out. Again, making it a 
process of elimination. So uh, these are very, very general descriptions and that's the way you should, should look at them, um, the brief descriptions and realize here's all the characteristics I know about my bacteria and now I'm gonna go read the obituaries. And if they don't match, I'm gonna kick the, the bacteria genus out of my list of finalists. So for example, right? So I already know I've got a gram positive pox. I, I know that they're tetrads. That by the way, could be a very important thing to look at. I also did the test that you're gonna do next week and found out that they were aerobes, right? They, they were strict aerobes. They don't like, they, they have no anaerobic tendencies whatsoever. So that makes them uh, a group, that's a characteristic that distinguishes them from all those others that have anaerobic tendencies. So I decided to focus on that because it's very broad and I noticed I'm looking through the obituaries that it allowed me to rule out a lot. Process of elimination, try to pick things that allow you to rule out the most at one time because that narrows your list for the next time. So it turns out lifestyle, you know, whether you like oxygen or not, um, is, is a very important feature when it comes to bacteria. Mine were aerobes. And so therefore I'm gonna rule out all of them that are either facultative or aerotolerant or any of the other anaerobic groups, which you'll be hearing all about next week. So based on this one thing, I did four, these four tests and I found out mine were strict aerobes. So I can rule out two thirds of the bacterial genuses that are in group 17, just on that one basis alone. So now I'm left with a much smaller number of options, of, of possible options here. Okay, so of the ones that are left, now I'm gonna go look at that list and I'm gonna say, all right, I got mine from my skin. So I'm gonna look at the list again and ones that don't, aren't routinely found on human skin, as I'm looking through the list, it's like, okay, this one is found in marine sediments. And as much as I would love to be at the ocean right now, uh, I was not when I took that skin samples and you know, I'm not an ocean. I'm not that salty. So therefore they, I'm going to rule the ones that were are marine um, derived. I can rule out the ones that are found, you know, in the intestines of a lobster or something like that. Um, because that, that's not the habitat where you got that bacteria from. So I'm going to rule out the ones that, you know, are not, it's not possible that I could, it could have come from my skin sample. And then I'm gonna be left with another little pile of, of maybe three, two or three or four uh, different genuses. So it's like, I gotta get down to just one. So now I'm gonna look at the ones that are left and I'm gonna say, all right, the other really notable feature about my bacteria is that they produce yellow colonies. They were pigmented yellow. So I'm gonna look through that list again and see if any produced, uh, if there were any that matched that produced a pigment, yellow or otherwise, or if there are, you know, if there are any I can rule out based on that. And it turns out producing this yellow pigment is characteristic for one or, you know, a couple. And I'm gonna rule out the ones that don't have pigmented colonies. And you gotta be careful with this because remember the, you know, the 50 shades of, of gray that can exist when it comes to the unpigmented types of colonies. So mine was very clearly a pigmented yellow. Other pigments are orange. Um, you know, there are others with red often shows up, but if it's a gray, uh, you know, you gotta be careful uh, with, the, you know, determining what's pigmented and not. If it isn't boldly pigmented, I would say, don't use that as a feature, look at other possible features. But the point being at this stage, I'm, taking the next step. If there's two left at this stage, then I got to look deeper and say, all right, what's the next thing that I do uh, that I can look at that would be helpful? Um, maybe they're modal. Maybe they're not modal. That's the test that I could do or so a thing I could figure out. But you're going to keep on doing this process of elimination until you're left with only one genus. And that would be the genus of the bacteria found on your skin. And that would be your, the project for you to identify the genus of bacteria that you isolated from your skin microbiota. Yay! And then what do you do? So I've figured it out. I have whatever I have on my skin, whatever that it turns out to be, I have this genus. So then I'm thinking, am I normal? Is this uh, a, a species or a type of bacteria that's commonly found on human skin? Am I unique? 
and I want to know more about that. And so if you remember, I gave you this article to read uh, way back. This is an excellent resource for you to use to go answer that question. So out of all the bacteria that you could have taken from your skin, you've identified one. So now go find out about that one. Um, and what I'm, you know, I'm kind of thinking that it would be great to summarize what are the, you know, how does it help the human skin microbiome. How does it help you? Does it, it does it um, enhance the health of your skin? Does it is it a detriment? Is it a disease causing microorganism? Um, what you'll probably find is that most of the microbiota, you know, they they play a protective role, but then every once in a while they flip and they they go over to the dark side and they can basically under the influence of other microbes they can actually cause uh, diseases and issues. So I'm hoping that you'll want to find out more about this bacteria that lives with you, that is part of you, that goes to sleep with you, that wakes up with you, that is with you every minute of every day. Um, and this is a great place to start. So this assignment, the HSMP uh, assignment, is for you to write a summary of what you find out about your skin bacteria based on the genus uh, that you identified. And I have a brief summary. No more than 500 words, which if, for those of you not used to this, that's no more than two paragraphs. You know, just one paragraph to summarize what you know about it, and then um, a, a paragraph to summarize what you found out about it, perhaps. Um, and this, is, this can be one of your references, but I'd like you to seek at least two more uh, references, two outside references, scholarly please, not Wikipedia, uh, to tell you more about the role of your microbe in the health of your skin environment, right? So what is, what is that microbe contributing to your microenvironment of your skin? That's the question that I would like you to answer. And I'm going to phrase that in the form of a question uh, because the assignment is going to be in the form of an essay in Blackboard, which you'll just basically type into the box uh, your answers to that and submit it through Blackboard. So I will put that what I just said in the form of a question, that will be your, it's gonna be an essay. I don't really like the word essay. I don't know why I've never liked the word essay. I prefer to think of it as a scholarly evaluation. Um, but nonetheless, it will come to you as an essay. So write a couple of paragraphs, uh, no more than 500 words, summing up what you've been able to find out. And that will be the end of our Human Skin Microbiome Project. And from this, I hope you have gained an appreciation of things, which number one, you have a skin microbiome and that the bacteria that are part of that skin microbiome are playing important roles in keeping your skin healthy. And they also play important roles in disease states that affect the skin. So, that, that's the huge takeaway that I hope you can fine tune once you know the identity of your bacteria. So I hope you had fun with this project. I hope Berkey's Manual works out with, for you very well. And um, any questions, you know where to find me. Thanks guys, talk to you soon.